All right, so it's time for the lecture. Uh, students will join in hopefully, slowly and gradually. And um, uh, because many students have got an exam today, so perhaps they'll listen to the recording. Please confirm that you can see the slides and you can hear me loud and clear. Please write yes on the chat if that is the case. All right, thank you very much. Uh, but, um, and uh, so today we are going to start with heart failure, a very important topic that you must understand because when you start your clinical lives, you are going to see a lot of patients with heart failure and you are going to prescribe a lot of drugs for heart failure. So it's very important to understand the basic mechanisms that underlie heart failure. It is also known as congestive heart failure because as we go along, I'll tell you what the definition of heart failure is, uh, but it causes congestion in the blood vessels. Congestion means that the blood accumulates in the blood vessels. It's not moving from there, all right? Or it is moving very slowly in the blood vessels. So it causes congestion. That is why it is also known as congestive heart failure. Now I'm showing you two hearts on this title slide. Which one do you think is the normal heart and which one is the abnormal heart? And that's a question for you guys and I want your answer on the chat or you can speak as well. The right one is a, is a normal. The, the right healthy. one, this is the right one or this is the right one? The, yeah, this is. This. Okay, this one. And so this is to the left actually, all right? Uh, so your answer is correct. This is the normal heart and this heart is a bit D-shaped, you know, it's not the normal shape like this one. It is, it looks a little bit bigger than the, this one. It has dilated a, a little bit. So what we see, the first see that th the first thing that we notice in a heart failure is that the heart is a little bit dilated. It's not the normal shape, all right? So let's start with the lecture. Once again, this is the book that we- It's also consult. a different color, doctor. And this is the textbook for your course. Is there any question or a comment? I can hear someone speaking in the background. All right. Uh, so that's our reference book. And um, we, uh, we will not go into the details of lecture outcomes and lecture objectives. We will right away start with the lecture. Okay, so this is the picture of a heart. And what I'm going to do is that I'm going to enlarge this portion of the heart so that we start with a discussion of the wall of the heart, all right? Because, you know, the heart has got muscles and it is the muscles that are contracting all the time. So let us see what the heart of uh, the wall of the heart is composed of or the, or the contents or different layers. So here is a blown out view. This is inside the heart over here and this is outside the heart, all right? So let's start from inside. We have got this thin layer of cells uh, inside on the inside, which is known as endocardium, all right? This is uh, uh, synonymous to endothelium in the blood vessels. And after this, we have got this thick layer of muscles, all right? This is known as myocardium. And then we have got a few layers outside. One is this one, one is this one, and there is the third one is this. And this bluish thing is actually fluid. So these two layers together are known as serous pericardium, right? And serous pericardium has got two layers. One is known as the visceral layer, and the other is known as the parietal layer. The visceral layer is just next to the myocardium, it is actually uh, considered as a part of myocardium. It is also known as epicardium. 
And then between the parietal and the visceral layers, we have got this fluid. This fluid is very important. Uh, it reduces the friction between the different layers when the heart uh, contracts and the, when the heart relaxes, all right? And uh, the outermost layer is a tough fibrous layer, uh, which is known as the fibrous pericardium and the parietal layer and the fibrous layer are actually, you know, adherent to each other. They are uh, inseparable, all right? So that was a quick review of the uh, wall, different layers of the wall of the heart. And I showed you this because basically we are in heart failure. The problem in most of the cases is with the myocardium, okay? So let us see uh, whether you remember uh, something from your physiology or not. This is a question for you. So please read it quickly and I need your answers on the chat. All right. See? Uh, so one is wrong. Uh, I didn't actually get what you said. Can you write on the chat, please? C, doctor. C. All right. Uh, well, C, you might think that C is wrong, but actually C is not wrong because you know, when, when the blood circulates, the blood is circulating because of the heart. You agree with me? So when the, bird, when the blood flows through an organ, it takes away with it the metabolic waste products. You know, it, when the blood circulates, it will take the nutrients and oxygen and the substrates to all the tissues, but at the same time, it will wash away the metabolic waste products. Okay, so let me see, I've got a couple of more answers. And the answers, one answer is D, is D to secrete chemical mediators that regulate urine output. Well, because we have not completed this lecture, so perhaps you do not know this information, this is actually not wrong, this is correct. The heart does secrete cert certain chemical things when the heart is stretched, this, uh, the chemical mediators are, are uh, actually known as natriuretic peptides, right? And they do regulate urine output, okay? And you know that the heart pumps blood to the lungs as well. They so, are all correct, doctor. Which one? All of them are uh, true. All, uh, well, well, I got one answer from Mansoor, which says that it is F. And I think the F is the correct answer because a sympathetic nervous system is actually not directly activated by the heart. You can say that the sympathetic nervous system is indirectly activated by the heart, but actually, you know, sympathetic nervous system is controlled uh, by the central nervous system by the brain. It has got strong connections with the vasomotor system, which controls the activities of the heart. But you can say that uh, it is indirectly controlled, but not directly controlled by the heart, all right? So among all these, F is, uh, seems to be the right answer because heart does not directly control the sympathetic nervous system. Right, so a little bit of more physiology that is needed to understand heart failure. Uh, which I have already shown you in this question, what are the essential functions of the heart? The job of the heart is to pump blood to the tissues to cover their metabolic needs. Now you see, let us suppose, you know, even if your heart is weak, let us suppose you get a patient with heart failure. It's not that his heart is not pumping. If the heart starts pumping, the patient is going to die, right? The heart is pumping, but the problem is it is not pumping enough to supply blood to the tissues, right? So one of the functions of the heart is to supply the tissues with adequate blood and oxygen and substrates. What are the substrates? The substrates could be glucose, it could be amino acids, it could be, um, I mean, uh, it could be lipids, it could be vitamins, all right? It could be proteins or so many things, right? And then uh, the second function of the heart is to receive all blood returning back from the tissues. Obviously the blood flows into the heart 
Uh, the blood flows into actually the right side of the heart. Okay, and assist removal of metabolic waste. And I just explained uh, that to you in the previous slide. So what are the essential conditions for fulfilling these functions? Okay, what is the condition that the heart must have in order to pump blood? And obviously the condition is that the heart should be normal. The structure of the heart should be normal, okay? So the normal structure and function of the heart and adequate filling of the heart. This is an important point, you know, adequate. Uh, so you, you might think that, you know, heart is always filled with blood, all right? Uh, that's normal. It sounds a bit uh, sort of uh, strange that I have written adequate filling of the heart by the blood. But remember that in certain conditions, the heart is not properly filled by the blood, okay? I'll, I'll give you one example. One example is, let us suppose that the heart is beating very fast, you know? And you know that the blood flows into the heart during diastole when the heart is dilating. When the heart is beating very fast, let us suppose 200 times in a minute, then there will not be enough time in diastole for the heart to fill. The diastole will be so short that the heart will not fill with blood. Another example, let us suppose that a person goes into cardiac arrest. You know, when you go to senior levels, you will do a course which is known as basic life support in which you give CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation to the patient, you know, you, you compress his chest, you know, if he has fainted and his heart is not working. Now, the problem in that situation is that although you, when you press the chest, the blood will go out of the heart, but the heart will not be filling with blood, okay? Or you still give a CPR, but it is not filling sufficiently with blood. So that is why adequate filling of the heart with blood is also an important condition to, uh, for the function of the heart, all right? Right, so what is heart failure? Uh, simply, it is the failure of the heart to perform its function, but that is not uh, enough to explain what is heart failure, okay? We must have a better definition to this. This one is better. It is the inability of the heart to supply adequate blood flow to the peripheral tissues. Okay, the heart is sending blood to the tissues, but it is sending very little. Let us suppose that you are very hungry and I give you very little food. You need, maybe you need two burgers from, uh, uh, from KFC or McDonald's, but I give you just uh, a small packet of French fries. That's not enough if you are very hungry, right? So the same happens, you know, the heart is supplying blood to the tissues, but that is not enough. It's so little blood that it does not fulfill the requirement of oxygen and nutrients for the tissues, all right? So here is the definition of heart failure. It is a complex syndrome. It is not simple. It is just not, you know, this one is not, still not enough. That heart is not supplying enough blood. So when the heart is not supplying enough blood, what happens then? That is also included in the definition of heart failure. That is why we call it a complex syndrome. What is a syndrome? Anybody knows what a syndrome is? A syndrome is actually a set of many symptoms. It's not one symptom. It is a combination of many symptoms that always occur together in a particular disease. So we call it a syndrome, all right? So in heart failure as well, there are a number of symptoms that are present. So it is a complex syndrome resulting from any functional or structural disorder of the heart that results in developing manifestations of low cardiac output. Now, what is cardiac output? It's a difficult definition, but try to understand this thing. Cardiac output is the amount of blood that goes out of the heart in one minute, all right? So obviously when the heart is not performing it, its function, it means it is not pumping out enough blood. When it is not pumping out enough blood, certain symptoms will develop in the patient. So, you know, it is now the definition of heart failure has become a bit complex. The heart is not supplying enough blood to the tissues, right? And as a result of that, there are certain symptoms that appear. Now that is the definition of heart failure, developing manifestations, which means appearance of symptoms. 
of low cardiac output, okay? Low cardiac output, in other words, is that the heart is not functioning properly, okay? Right, so what are those symptoms? Those are reduced exercise capacity. If the person is just doing very light work, like you go to the kitchen and make tea, the person will, with heart failure will not have any problem. But if he does anything more than that, he has to walk maybe say 200 meters or 400 meters, then his exercise capacity is going to be reduced, all right? And fatigue, he will feel tired, you know? He will feel tired even after he does a little bit of work or, uh, you know, he, uh, he does a little bit of exercise, goes up the stairs, he will get fatigued and tired. Why? Because the muscles are also not getting enough blood and oxygen and glucose. So they cannot convert glucose, they cannot utilize glucose, all right? Uh, then there will be shortness of breath as well due to pulmonary congestion. You know, the, the blood goes from the right heart, from the right ventricle into the lungs. And from the lungs, it goes to the left atrium and the left ventricle. So if there is a problem with the left side of the heart, the blood is going to accumulate in the lungs, all right? That is known as pulmonary congestion and that might lead to shortness of breath. So these are the things we said, developing manifestation of low cardiac output. What do we mean by that? We mean reduced exercise capacity, fatigue and shortness of breath, all right? Okay, and of course, organ dysfunction. You know, when you're not giving enough blood to the organs, they are not going to function normally. So malfunction or dysfunction of the heart is going to lead to dysfunction of the organs as well. And I've given you one example, which is uh, kidneys. Um, the, the patient might go into renal failure, okay? I'll not go into any more details. Uh, we will come to that later on. Right, so this slide shows you the classification of heart failure. You know, you know that a patient has got heart failure because of certain symptoms that I've given you. He, he, he is an old man, right? The patient comes to you, he is an old man, and he tells you that, you know, I feel very weak and I do a little bit of work, I get tired. And when you examine him, you know, sometimes when you examine the heart failure patients, you look at their feet or their ankles and you see that they are swollen. That is a sign of heart failure. And uh, maybe he will tell you, you know, I'm passing very little urine. So you, you know that he has got heart failure, but how serious is that heart failure? And that is what this slide is going to show you that heart failure has got many stages. C stage A, stage B, stage C and stage D. Now stage A is always very mild. Okay, and stage D is always the most serious. So stage A and stage D are very easy to understand. Stage A is so mild that maybe he doesn't have any symptoms, but you know, when you examine him carefully, you find that he has got heart failure or he has got a risk for heart failure. And stage D is so serious that the patient is now at the end stage. He cannot get up from the bed. So stages A, we have got two classifications. I'm showing you one, this stands for American College of Cardiology and AHA stands for American Heart Association. So this staging has been uh, made by these two uh, colleges, okay? So in these two, we look at two things, structural, whether there is a structural disorder present or not, or whether the symptoms of heart failure are present or not. And the symptoms are fatigue and weakness and maybe problems with the organs, okay? So in the first, there is nothing, nothing, okay? No structural disorder and no symptoms of heart failure. So then why are we calling it a heart failure? Well, actually, because we have examined the patient and we know that he is at a high risk. He doesn't have heart failure, but he's at a high risk of developing heart failure. Now, which patient is at a high risk which person is at a high risk of developing heart failure? Can you give me an example? Yeah, hypertension. Uh, very good, hypertension. If, if a person does not, has hypertension 
and you give him medicines, he does not take his medicines, he does not control his blood pressure or the doctor is not giving him sufficient dose of the drug which is not controlling his uh, blood pressure, he is at a risk of developing heart failure. Now st in stage B, you see there is no defect, just risk. There is structural disorder present, but there is no symptom, right? Now, as we go further, I'll tell you that the heart has got a lot of reserve. So I'll, uh, you will understand why, despite being uh, there being a structural disorder, why is there no symptom, okay? Maybe there is a little bit of hypertrophy of the heart. You know, in the previous lecture, we said when a person has got hypertension, his heart undergoes hypertrophy. Now, hypertrophy is a structural disorder but the symptoms of heart failure are not there. He is at a risk of developing heart failure. Now in this, now I hope you know this because I've already said that D is the last stage. He's bedridden, you know, you cannot do anything. All you can do is give him a heart transplant, okay? So what will be C? Obviously in C, the structural disorder is also present and symptoms of heart failure are also present, okay? So, uh, present, for example, hypertrophy or valvular defect, there could be many defects, uh, either previously um, or present. So both the defect, uh, structural defect and symptoms are present, okay? And this is the end stage. Uh, he requires specialized management. Uh, either you give him uh, some, uh, uh, the ultimate treatment is actually uh, heart transplant, but there are some assistive devices that can help the heart to contract, okay? So that was um, about the level of heart failure. So once you diagnose heart failure, you also have to know how serious is the heart failure. So this will help you stratify the patient, put the patient in a category, and accordingly you will treat that patient. Obviously, if it is, if it is mild, you won't give him a very aggressive treatment, but in stage C, you will give him a very aggressive treatment. All right, so I'll not give you the treatment because treatment we will do in therapy or maybe you have already done it, but we'll not go into the details of treatment. So which of the following sentences define cardiac output? Now you have done that in your physiology. Let's see whether you remember that or not. Actually, I just mentioned that to you a minute ago. Uh, C, doctor. Perfect. Very good. Excellent. Yes, it is C, okay? It is the amount of the blood that the heart pumps out in one minute. That is what um, cardiac output is, okay? And uh, now let's um, go to definitions once again, because we will try to understand heart failure by one or two different ways, okay? Uh, so, um, um, Cardiac output is the amount of blood ventricles eject e each minute. Cardiac output is the major determinant of cardiac performance, okay? Otherwise, actually, you know, when the patient comes to the hospital and you examine him, you don't measure the cardiac output. You measure something else, which is known as ejection fraction, okay? But cardiac output is also a major determinant of cardiac performance. You can calculate that. Uh, during sleep, now, you know, I mentioned that heart has got a lot of reserve, okay? Um, during sleep, cardiac output declines and during um, exercise, it increases markedly. See, now you're all sitting down. I'm going a bit slow in this lecture because I want you to understand this lecture. We are all sitting down, right? What is our cardiac output? Our cardiac output is... Uh, just say maybe five liters in a minute. We don't need a lot of blood. Our muscles are not exercising. So we just need a little bit of oxygen and um, some glucose. That will be sufficient. So the heart does not need to uh, increase its cardiac output, right? But um, so let us suppose that when we are sitting, our cardiac output is five liters. But when you are doing exercise, now all your muscles are working. And I told you previously that in a male, in a young boy, let us say, about 45 to 50% of his body is made up of muscles, 
right? Even in girls, it is about 35 to 40% muscles, say 35%. So you've got a lot of muscles, about 45% of your body is muscles. And when you start exercising, they'll need a lot of oxygen and blood. So your cardiac output increases five to six times, which means if you are sitting and it is five liters, when you're doing exercises, it will be 25 to 30 liters. You know, that is a big increase. So cardiac reserve, you see five, liter, five liters when you are sitting or when you are resting and 30 liters or 25 liters when you're doing exercise. So the difference between the two is known as the cardiac reserve. Your heart has got reserve. You know, if I do exercise, I'm not young like you. I'm an old man. How much will be my uh, cardiac output when I do exercise? Can anybody guess? Because I'm not young. If I, I, I can't do exercises like you, you know. I can't swim 20 lengths of a swimming pool or I cannot run for two miles, you know. So I don't need as much of cardiac output as you do when you are doing exercises. So let us suppose, let us say my cardiac output is 15 liters, okay? Your cardiac output is 30 liters, right? So what is your reserve and what is my reserve? My cardiac reserve is much, much less than yours. At rest, we are all the same. At rest, my output is also five liters uh, cardiac output and your cardiac output is also five liters. But when we do exercises, your cardiac output will go to 25 or 30 liters, whereas my cardiac output maximum might go to 15 liters only, which means you have got a lot more reserve than me, okay? That is what I mean by cardiac reserve. So how do you calculate that? You uh, just subtract your maximum cardiac uh, output from the minimum. Maybe I'll show you in the next slide. Yes, here it goes. So the cardiac reserve is equal to cardiac output in exercise maximum vigorous exercise minus cardiac output at rest, all right? Now, what happens in heart failure? In heart failure, the ca cardiac reserve is markedly diminished. You know, initially I said, you don't have any symptoms. The heart failure patient will not has, have any symptoms. Why? Because he doesn't do exercise like you. He cannot do it, you know? We don't measure it. But the thing is, I'm not in heart failure. I'm just old, okay? Uh, so although my cardiac reserve is also decreased, but in heart failure, it will be decreased even more than that. And although at rest, the patient normal activities, he will not have any signs and symptoms in stage one, but later stages, he might develop signs and symptoms, all right? So in heart failure, the reserve is markedly diminished, okay? Now, what controls the cardiac output? How does the cardiac output increase? And I'm in introducing a couple of new terms that I'm going to explain to you. It is myocardial contractility is number one. If the heart contracts with a greater force, the, uh, the cardiac output will be greater, more blood will go out of the heart, all right? The greater the force with which the heart contracts, the higher will be the amount of blood that goes out of the heart that is ejected from the heart. Then preload and afterload. Now these are the two terms that I'll explain to you in the coming slides. So what are pre preload and afterload, all right? So before we go there, let's, I'll discuss cardiac reserve once more and uh, I'll show you some calculation over here. So cardiac reserve, it is the capacity of the heart to increase cardiac output over and above the resting level. This is a glass. Okay. And, you know, this, maybe it is water in this, let's suppose it's water, or maybe it is uh, some other drink, you know, colorless drink. Now, this is the reserve, you can put this much of water in this glass, okay, and you, you fill this glass with this much of water, and um, you keep it there so that you drink it later on, all right, let us see what happens. In heart failure, the cardiac reserve declines and if untreated, gradually abolishes. So st a stage will come, there'll be no cardiac reserve left. And with further progression of congestive heart failure, cardiac output becomes even less than what you need at rest, becomes insufficient to meet the requirement of the body even at rest, all right? Look at this glass, you know, now it is full of water, you have got 
a lot of water in reserve but then somebody comes and he drinks a little bit of water so your your reserve is now a little bit less and he drinks more water someone else comes and someone else comes you know so what you had for yourself as no is no this much okay all the reserve that you kept for yourself has gone okay someone he just took it and eventually you have nothing that is what happens to the heart the reserve slowly goes on decreasing 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 until a stage comes when even at rest the cardiac output is so little that it cannot fulfill the requirements of the organs all right and you know when the organs are not getting enough blood what are they going to do obviously they will not function properly but they are also going to complain to the brain they will complain to the brain that the heart is not sending us enough blood all right and and then the what will the brain do the brain will send a message to the heart you know why are you not sending enough blood you must work more and we'll come back to this point later on all right so um, once again stage a is no defect just risk stage b um, still no symptoms but the defect is present all right uh, anyway uh, we come to another term now which is known as stroke volume which of the following sentences define stroke volume a doctor okay that is very good there is only i think it's only one student who is answering me what's your name fail doctor fail is all right is it only fail who is answering me or is it someone doctor. else why not fail uh, sorry say that again fail file okay. wail w a i l oh wail okay yes yes i now remember your name i see that in attendance wail okay thank you wail that's wonderful yes you're right stroke volume is the volume of the blood that heart pumps out in one heartbeat okay this see you already saw it as cardiac output so this was already out okay that is the right answer all right so before we go any further I think it's time for attendance, and first the boys will write their names, and after that I'll ask the girls to write their names. So this is time for attendance for the boys. Okay. So there is while over there. Okay now girls please write your names Okay that is good the girls are a bit quicker than the boys right so let's continue with the lecture so stroke volume is the volume of blood pumped out with each beat about 70 ml in a 70 kg man you know there are differences in some uh, in people uh, some are small some are big so there are going to be differences but we take averages all right so what is the relationship of stroke volume with cardiac output um, so this is your heart okay this heart is in diastole okay the heart muscle is relaxed this heart is in systole the muscle is contracting all right and suppose the end diastolic volume when the heart is relaxed fully relaxed at the end of diastole let us suppose it is 140 ml and then the heart contracts and after the heart has fully contracted the volume left in the heart is 70 ml so what is the cardiac output sorry not the cardiac output what is the stroke volume Uh, doctor, the cardiac output is one hundred forty minus seventy. That's stroke volume, not cardiac output. Okay, you're right. The stroke volume, which is the amount of blood that goes out in one heartbeat, will come to uh, cardiac output after this. So that is one forty minus seventy. It is seventy ml. So stroke volume is equal to end diastolic volume minus end diastolic volume minus the And systolic volume. 
okay cardiac output is stroke volume multiplied by heart rate okay heart rate is regulated by a balance between the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system i hope you already know that okay if you have attended my lecture on the autonomic nervous system you will know what the sympathetic and parasympathetic are doing to the heart right uh, which of the following sentences define defines ejection fraction uh, b doctor b doctor b doctor word, it is b you are right the percentage of blood that the heart pumps out in one heartbeat uh no that is uh, pumps this is not correct ejection fraction is uh, sorry this is miskeyed all right it is b is the correct answer the percentage of blood that the heart pumps out in one heartbeat all right now let us see what do we mean by that and you will have to do a little bit of calculation in this slide ejection fraction is the percentage of blood pumped out of each ventricle in each heartbeat okay it is the end diastolic volume so sorry no here is a question for you now if the end diastolic volume is 150 ml and each ventricle pumps out 100 ml of blood with with a beat what is the stroke volume uh, 15 50 okay one person has said 50 any other answer 100 doctor who said 100 what's your Me, name doctor uh m a t r matter matter excellent you know i ask this question in every lecture and every time the students say 50 ml the correct answer is actually 100 ml you know because we said that stroke volume is the amount of blood that the ventricle pumps out in one beat so here i have written that the ventricle is pumping out 100 ml okay with each beat so stroke volume is 100 ml but now the next question is what is the what is the ejection fraction it is the percentage of blood okay so what percent is being pumped out can you calculate that doctor 100 over 150 divided by 100 no not divided multiplied by 100 multiplied so yes that is the right answer okay so it is so we see it is a percentage so it is 60 it's this is a volume and this is a percentage okay so that is the difference between ejection fraction and uh, uh, stroke volume now why did i tell you about the ejection fraction it is the ejection fraction that we measure when a patient comes to us with heart failure and as i will tell you later on we, there are categories of heart failure which is heart failure with uh, preserved ejection fraction and heart failure with reduced ejection fraction okay so it is based on ejection fraction so a patient comes to you and i the doctor tells you you see this patient's ejection fraction is 50% so 50% is less than normal normal is actually 55% up to 55% maybe i've written it over here so 55 to 70% is normal uh, so if i say that it's 50% it's less than normal but not too bad but if i say that the ejection fraction is 30% then you will be worried okay that's uh, too little okay so that's uh, the that's what ejection fraction is right now let's go on to preload and afterload preload is the end diastolic volume it increases as the venous return increases so the more the end diastolic volume the more will be the cardiac muscle fiber stretch now what is preload preload is the amount of blood that is flowing into the heart okay if more blood flows into the heart there will be greater preload if less blood flows into the heart there will be less preload okay so if the preload is more if more blood flows into the heart the heart will dilate more right it will become bigger in size that doesn't make any difference for normal heart you know normal people even if 200 ml 
flows into the heart, no problem. Heart will dilate a little bit. That doesn't make any difference. Afterload is the counter force. The force the contracting heart must generate to eject blood, a little bit difficult to understand, but I'll explain that to you. It depends upon the systemic vascular resistance. Now some technical terms are being used over here. The higher the resistance, for example, in hypertension, you are pumping the blood out at against a higher pressure. So the afterload is going to be greater. It is different from preload. Preload is the amount of blood coming into the heart. Afterload is the pressure against which the heart is pumping, okay? Right, so see this woman. This woman has got water in the bucket, all right? Now, let us suppose that she has got a little bit of water up to here. That is the preload, okay? Let us suppose that you fill the bucket up to here. It will become heavier. She'll have to do more work. That is the preload. So if that is the preload, then what is the afterload? See, preload is the amount of water in this bucket. But the, she see this is she is going up. She is she has to go uphill. If she is to go downhill on the other side, it will be easier. But she has this weight and she has to go uphill. And this uphill is the afterload. So preload is the amount of blood that comes into the heart during diastole. And afterload is after the heart starts contracting, it is the pressure against which the heart is working. All right? And see, the load one has to carry. This, you know, if, if, if you give a lot of load this, to this woman, you know, she won't be able to pick it up. The same happens to the heart, not to normal heart. If it's a young boy or a young girl, no problem. They can carry a lot of weight. But if it's a weak, diseased woman, then she won't be able to carry a lot of weight. So the same happens to the heart. If the heart is failing, obviously the heart fails when it has got some disease and you put in a lot of blood into the heart during diastole. We also call it venous return, the blood that is returning through the veins, okay? So that becomes, how does preload affect the failing heart? Like this, you know, this, this poor donkey, you have put a lot of weight on this donkey. So it has, you know, the balance, the poor uh, little fellow has gone up into the air. So the same thing happens to the heart, uh, not to a normal heart. The normal heart has got a lot of reserve, you know, 25 to 30 liters. But if it's a poor failing heart, then this is what is going to happen to the heart, all right? And then that will make some complications. So you got, you know, so now I hope you understand what preload is. Now in the next video, I'm going to show you what afterload is and how does it affect the heart. Now this is a video which will show there are some girls and boys who are walking against the wind. You know, they have a bag. This bag is like their preload. They are carrying this bag. But see what the afterload is. Watch this uh, video carefully. All right, so that was there for normal young people. Now this is like a, this old man is like a failing heart, all right? He cannot do it, you know? The poor fellow, he will need help. He's too old. So you see there, there is help. You know, it's like giving treatment to a failing heart. Okay, so now I hope you got the point. The point is that there are three things. I mentioned three things. It is either the contractility of the heart. We are talking of the load that is there on the heart. 
and why are we discussing the load because in a failing heart when we treat a failing heart we must reduce the load okay because if the heart has to contract with a greater force then obviously it has to have that power okay so that is one thing you have to reduce the contractility through some medications number 2 you have to reduce the preload so that a lot of blood doesn't go into the heart that will increase the workload and number 3 you have to reduce the afterload you know the bags are their preload but the wind is the afterload they have to walk against the wind and the heart has to eject blood against the pressure that is there in the aorta so you, you can call it blood pressure in other ways it could also be fluid volume so you see this is helpful in understanding the treatment that you are giving reduce the preload reduce the afterload reduce the contractility of the heart so that the heart does not go any further into uh, failure okay all right which of the following sentences defines venous return d i think now oh, well it is oh, oh, clearly it is d because the d, previous three we have already checked you know this is cardiac output this is uh, uh, ejection fraction and this is stroke volume so it must be d the volume of blood uh, preload or venous venous return is same as preload okay so the volume of the blood that the heart receives from superior and inferior vena cavi is the preload all right so venous return the blood that flows into the heart um, from veins is called venous return uh, and venous blood you know flows in diastole when the heart is relaxing when the heart is contracting which is systole the blood is not flowing into the heart the blood is going out of the heart okay so end diastolic volume is this it depends upon venous return it is the amount of blood in a ventricle at the end of diastole okay maybe it is 135 ml in each ventricle it could be more it could be less so this is what is showing you the venous return here the venous return is low just like filling a bucket here the venous return is more here here the venous return is even more now which bucket is more difficult to lift so what i'm trying to show you is as the venous return increases the workload increases this bucket is much more difficult to lift lift compared to this bucket all right so the greater the preload the greater the venous return the greater the end diastolic volume the more will be the load workload on the heart okay right so venous return greater end diastolic volume more preload more workload on the heart okay in treatment of heart failure one strategy is to reduce workload on the heart by reducing the preload and the afterload what do you think it's correct or it's yes true? doctor throw okay. doctor it is true good yes that is what we are trying to do um so calcium channel blockers are also known as afterload reducing agents because they reduce the blood pressure but there are many other drugs so preload load is already present at the start of the activity before the heart starts contracting the preload is already there it is the amount of blood the weight that someone is carrying before the muscle contraction begins afterload begins after the muscle is contracting you know when the person in the video when they started walking so the resistance encountered after the start of the activity after the muscles contract increase in preload increase in afterload they are both not good for the heart both will increase workload on heart and need to be reduced in heart failure all right which of the following structural abnormalities will increase the workload on the right ventricle see now i have not said right left ventricle i am talking of the right ventricle uh see the sir c is correct yes you are right pulmonary hypertension will increase the workload because you know 
left heart works against the systemic blood pressure, but the right heart is pumping blood into the lungs. So if the, if the uh, pressure is high in the lungs, obviously the workload is going to increase. Okay, you're right. What about left heart failure? If the left heart fails, again, the blood is going to um, uh, pool in the lungs, okay? The blood is going to accumulate in the lungs. So again, same thing, it is going to increase uh, pressure in the lungs or it is going to cause pulmonary hypertension. So this is also correct. Pulmonary valve stenosis, you know, when the right heart contracts, the blood goes out of the pulmonary valves into the pulmonary trunk, the pulmonary artery. If that valve is very no, narrow, you know, stenosis means narrow. So obviously it's not opening up. So the heart, you know, if, if the door is not fully opening, you know, you go out of the door. If the door is open, you can go out very easily. But if I open a door very little, you'll have to squeeze through. You'll have to, you'll have difficulty in going through the doors to the door. So that's what stenosis is. It's not open. So again, that's going to increase the workload on the heart and tricuspid valve prolapse. You know, the blood, blood comes into the right ventricle through the tricuspid valve. It's between the right atrium and the right ventricle. If, pro, if it prolapses, which means when the ventricle starts contracting, the valve does not close, okay? It, it should close, but it doesn't close because it is prolapsed. So the blood goes back into the atrium. And that is going to increase the workload because instead of going into the lungs, now the blood is going back and it will come back again. So that's increasing the workload, all right? So all of them are actually correct, okay? Right, uh, so I think it's time for a break. We'll take a break and then we'll come to cardiac cycle and then we will go into some, some more details of heart failure. And uh, uh, maybe I'll go a little bit faster because uh, we have done very little so far. Okay, so please remind me to resume recording when we come back, okay? All right, <clears throat> let's start once again. I hope everyone is back. So we were doing cardiac cycle and I'm going to go very quickly through the cardiac cycle because you already know it, all right? It's just very simple. Uh, and um, uh, I will also explain to you what we discussed in the last slide that which of the following structural abnormalities will increase the workload on the right ventricle, which I have given over here. And uh, I have given in the next slide as well over here. Right, so let us see how, what the cardiac cycle is. The blood will flow from the inferior vena cava and superior vena cava into the right ventricle right? From the right ventricle, the blood will flow into the right atrium. So this is the preload, the amount of blood that is flowing into the heart during diastole. It, in the right heart, it comes from the superior and inferior vena cavi, and in the left heart, it will come from the lungs, okay? But the amount is the same, okay? And all right, so from here, it will go into the pulmonary artery. Sorry, this is not a vein, this is artery, pulmonary artery. And from the pulmonary arteries, it will go into the lungs. Now, see, let's go back uh, for a minute. This says tricuspid valve prolapse. We said that it's going to increase the uh, workload on the heart. So, you know, this is the tricuspid valve. When the right ventricle contracts, this valve should close down, okay? And the blood will go into the pulmonary artery. But prolapse means instead of closing down, this will go on to this side and it will not close down, which means normally the blood does not go back from the right ventricle into the right atrium. But when there is, when there is tricuspid valve prolapse, then the blood is going to go back that's going to increase the workload, right? Second is pulmonary valve stenosis. This is the pulmonary valve. If this does not open properly, then it will be difficult to, for the right ventricle to pump blood into the pulmonary artery. It's not vein, it's artery, right? So this is also stenosis, 
which means narrowing is also going to increase the workload on the heart, right? Now, then it goes into the lungs. If there is higher pressure in the capillaries, it's known as pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Uh, so if the pressure is higher, normally, you know, up to 15 millimeter in the systemic circulation, you see it goes up to 120 uh, millimeter of mercury. But here, now it's about normal is 12, 8 to 12 millimeter, right? Up to 15, it is all right. So it's low pressure, but let us suppose it goes up to 20 or 25. That means the pressure has increased and it will, this, the right ventricle will have to do more work to push the blood into the lungs, all right? So that's pulmonary hypertension. And from the lungs, it will go to the left atrium. And from the left atrium, it will go to the left ventricle. If the left ventricle fails, right? If there is left heart failure, this is the left side of the heart. Then the blood will pool here and the blood will pool in the lungs. And again, the pressure will be transmitted through the pulmonary artery to the right ventricle. So all of these are correct, all right? And then eventually uh, it goes into the aorta and the rest of the body. So that was a quick uh, description of the cardiac cycle. So preload is the amount of blood that is flowing into the right and the left ventricles at the end of uh, uh, diastole or during diastole. And afterload is the pressure in the aorta against which the heart is working, or it is the pressure or the capillary pressure or pulmonary pressure in the lungs against which the right heart will, uh, works, okay? So the pressure, there's a pressure difference over here. This generates, the left ventricle generates a pressure of more than 120 millimeter of mercury, more than the systolic blood pressure, uh, or about the same as the systolic blood pressure. Uh, and the right heart generates a pressure which is very low. It's about 20, 25 millimeter of mercury, you know, because there is not a high pressure in the lungs, all right? So uh, that is the afterload. Now, how does the, react, how does the heart react to increase in load? Now, what happens, let us suppose it's a young person, okay? And a lot of blood flows into the heart, into his heart or her heart. So what's going to happen? It's a normal heart, it's a healthy heart, it's not a failing heart in a young person, right? So what I'm going to show you is known as the Frank Starling mechanism, which means that in a normal healthy heart, the more the blood flows into the heart, the stronger will be the contraction, right? as opposed to a failing heart. If you put a lot of blood into a failing heart, we are going to get problems. But if you, if the venous return increases and the end diastolic volume is uh, larger in a normal heart, it will contract with a greater force. That is what Frank Starling mechanism is, okay? So in a normal heart, when the load increases, you know, this is the first thing that happens. Frank Starling mechanism, kicks in and the heart contracts with a greater force. The second thing is the normal heart will hypertrophy, right? For example, when you're doing exercises, your venous return increases tremendously, okay? And uh, it's equal to your cardiac output. So in, in, uh, in a person who is an athlete or who does physical exercises regularly, it, his heart becomes stronger right? It undergoes hypertrophy, but this is physiological hypertrophy. It's not pathological hypertrophy. So increase in mass of contractile elements leads to increased strength of contraction. Now, these are the normal responses of the heart to increased workload. Increased sympathetic adrenergic activity, very important because whenever you are exercising, when you're doing vigorous physical ex exertion, your sympathetic nervous system uh, is activated um, and it increases the heart rate, it will increase the contractility, the force of contraction, right? So that is also helping you to adjust to the increased uh, demand for the work, okay? Increased activity of renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, 
this is a long acting system, just like hypertrophy. These in, increase sympathetic activity and Frank Starling mechanism, they kick in immediately, they start working immediately. But ventricular hypertrophy, you know, it will take a long time, month, months, or maybe years. Same renin angiotensin aldosterone system, this also takes a, a, a lot of sort of a longer time, maybe three or four days to get activated, okay, or to get effective. So these are the responses uh, to the failing heart. Now, uh, in the next slide, I'm going to explain to you what I mean by Frank Starling mechanism. Now, here is a balloon uh, represents the relation. Let me explain to you first. It represents the relationship between stroke volume and end diastolic volume. Stroke volume increases in response to increase in uh, blood volume, right? So what in a normal heart, what we are doing is if we increase the volume, the blood will, the heart will contract uh, with a greater force. If you increase the preload, increase the end diastolic volume, the heart will contract with a greater force, just like this balloon. Although in this balloon, it is uh, the elastic forces that are working in the heart, it is other forces, muscular forces. There are some elastic forces as well. So see what happens if you, uh, if you uh, say blow more air into this balloon and leave it, it will contract with a greater force. See, I'll just show it to you. <laughs> All right, so that was fun. And uh, so you see what I'm trying to explain to you is that in a normal heart, uh, if, you, uh, if you infuse more blood, if there is more blood into the heart, it will contract with a greater force, just like this balloon. But the difference between the balloon and the heart is that the balloon is just elastic fibers and heart is muscles, okay? It is the muscles that contract with a greater force. I'm not going into a lot of details because this involves the length of the sarcomeres and the overlap of the actin myosin filaments. I know you will get confused if I go into those details, but uh, I hope uh, Frank Starling mechanism is clear to you uh, to, uh, to some extent. Sorry, let me stop this thing, very noisy. So the greater the stretching of cardiac muscle fiber, the greater will be the force of contraction. Right, okay, you'll read this and answer this question. The the yes, it is true. Okay. So I just wanted you to read the definition of heart failure. All right. This is correct. It is true. Right. Now, once again, we are coming back to the definition of heart failure. Heart failure has been defined as a complex syndrome. Again, let me explain to you. It is a syndrome, right? Although the heart is unable to pump enough blood to the tissues, to fulfill their metabolic needs. In addition to that, it is also a syndrome, a combination of symptoms like fatigue and like weakness and like breathlessness, all right, that appear. Um, and why is it there? Because of any functional or structural disorder. So if I ask you the definition of heart failure, don't just write that it is a functional disorder or a structural disorder of the heart. You have to give full explanation to me, all right? That results in or increases the risk of developing manifestations of low cardiac output or pulmonary systemic congestion. So due to low cardiac output, the person will feel weak. Due to pulmonary systemic congestion, the person will get breathless because the blood is pooling in the lungs, okay? 
There is another def definition. It is a pathophysiological process in which heart is unable to meet the metabolic requirements of tissues for oxygen, nutrients, despite the venous return to the heart is either normal or increased, right? So this is the key sentence, unable to meet the metabolic requirements. If you write this, you get one out of one mark, okay? Because usually uh, a written question is one mark, okay? Right. So those were the other definitions. And now I come to another point uh, that you must know in heart failure. Uh, so uh, once again, let me repeat what I have already said. Heart failure is a complex clinical syndrome that results from any structural or functional impairment of ventricular filling or ejection of blood. Now, why do we get heart failure? Either the filling of the heart is not good. You know, if, if the heart fills with very little blood, then obviously the blood going out of the heart is going to be uh, uh, very small in amount, okay? Very little blood will go out of the heart. The, so that will lead to a reduced uh, uh, cardiac output, all right? So I'm saying the same thing in a different way. So cardinal manifestations of heart failure are dyspnea, which is shortness of breath, fatigue, which is uh, getting tired or feeling weak, and fluid retention. Uh, fluid retention is an important point. You know, in heart failure patients, the weight increases, all right? The body weight increases because the, there is water accumulating being retained in the body. Why? Because the kidneys are not working properly. Why are the kidneys? There's no problem with the kidneys. But the thing is that the pumping of the heart is so weak that not enough blood is going to the kidneys. It's not a problem with the kidneys. So the GFR, the glomerular filtration rate decreases because the heart should pump blood with enough force and enough pressure so that the kidneys get enough GFR, right? That is not happening, so we get fluid retention. All of these, especially these two result in decreased exercise tolerance. If the patient is asked to go up the stairs, he will get breathless, right? And fluid retention is going to lead to pulmonary congestion, splanchanic congestion, which means in the liver or the GIT and peripheral edema. I said that the person, if you look at his ankles or the feet, there, there's going to be swelling over there, okay? That is edema. So these are the, that is what I mean by uh, the heart failure syndrome, or you can call this manifestations of low cardiac output, okay? So majority of the patients complain primarily of edema, dyspnea, or fatigue. Edema in the feet and the ankles, because that's where it appears first. In very advanced cases of heart failure, there is going to be edema of the whole, whole body. You will see that the face of the patient becomes big, right? So you will know that, you know, he's in severe heart failure. You give him injection Lasix, furosemide, 80 milligram, and next day his face will become small because the water has gone out of his body, okay? So this is the complaint that the majority of the patients have. Some have exercise intolerance, but little fluid retention. There are differences. So ejection fraction is the criterion, right? Ejection fraction is considered important in classification of patients with heart failure. Now I'm going to show you two classifications which are based on ejection fraction. We have got two types of heart failure. One is known as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. It is, we, in short, we call it HEF-REF, right? Which means heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. When the ejection fraction is less than 40%, we call, we say that the patient is in HEF-REF, right? Uh, so um, normal ejection fraction, I said, is 55% or more than that. Less than 40% is uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction or HEF-REF. Systolic uh, heart failure efficacious therapy. For this type of heart failure, we have got good treatment. But the next one is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. We call it HEF-PEF, okay? So uh, uh, 
here the ejection fraction is more than 50%. I said normal is 5%. It is close to normal. No problem with the ejection fraction. But we, we also call it diastolic heart failure. Right? This one is systolic heart failure. This one is diastolic heart failure. The problem here is that the heart, you know, there is some problem in diastole. The heart does not expand. There is some problem, you know, if you want to put more blood into the heart, the heart must expand. But the problem over here is that due to some disease, the heart is not expanding. So enough blood is not flowing into the heart during diastole. All right, and unfortunately for this one, we do not have any good treatment and it's more common in women, all right? Right, so another thing that you should know about heart failure, I know it's complex, but you must uh, understand this because there are so many cases, you know, the maximum cases, when you go to your clinical um, rotations or your clinical life, you're going to get cases of hypertension. You're going to get cases of hyperlipidemia. You're going to get cases of diabetes. You're going to get cases of ischemic heart disease. You're going to get cases of heart failure. Lots, these are the common cases that you're going to see every day. That is why I'm going into a, a bit more details, right? So atrial natriuretic peptide is released from atrial uh, cells. It's also released from the ventricles and uh, it is released in response to the stretch of the heart. You know, we said that in, um, in heart failure, especially if it's in systolic heart failure or heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, actually the heart dilates, okay? So when the heart dilates, the walls stretch and this atrial natriuretic peptide is released and it is a good thing. This is a very good thing, you know. When a patient is in heart failure, we measure this atrial natriuretic peptide. Okay, we call it, we don't call it ANP, we call it BNP, uh, but B-type natriuretic peptide um, because uh, that is more sensitive uh, and uh, there is also an NT pro BNP that test is known as. If the levels are very high, that means that the heart failure is more severe. You see BNP is secreted by the ventricles. It is known as brain natriuretic peptide. Uh, it was originally found in pig, pig porcine, pig, pig brain, all right? So BNP is secreted by the ventricles. Both uh, are secreted in response to wall stretch, pressure, and fluid overload. So this higher levels or elevated levels of BNP are biomarkers for heart failure. If, if a, you know, normal, they've got different ranges, say 100 to 150. If it is 300, there is heart failure. If it is 1000, the heart failure is more severe. If it is 1500, the heart failure is even more severe. So the higher the level, the more severe the heart failure is. The serum levels of BNP and NT pro BNP are well correlated with the extent of ventricular dysfunction, right? You got this point there. The higher the levels, the, the greater will be the ventricular dysfunction. It can increase up to 30 fold in patients with advanced heart failure. And I'll tell you something, you know, let us suppose that um, uh, normal is, if normal is 100, 30 fold means 3000, okay? And uh, if it is 150, maybe it is 4,500. Uh, 30 times, okay. Now, I'll tell you something very interesting. <clears throat> uh, my my mother-in-law had heart failure. And once she developed some infection in the lungs, so we had, or maybe, or perhaps uh, she had pulmonary edema, you know, heart failure. Patients with severe heart failure, they often go into pulmonary edema. And you, again, you have to give them diuretics like furosemide uh, intravenously. Uh, so uh, we took her to the hospital and they sent the result for this uh, anti-pro BNP. And the result came back, it was 10,000. And so next day we sent that again and the result came back, it was 30,000. Now, I don't know whether there, there was some mistake or not, but 30,000 is too high. Anyway, the higher it is, the more serious the heart failure is. 
The biological half-life is BNP is twice as long as that of ANP, and that is and that of NT pro BNP is even longer. That is why we measure BNP and not ANP. Okay, uh, so these peptides are better targets than ANP for diagnostic blood testing. Okay, which of the following tests is or are suitable in patients with heart failure? So a patient comes to you with heart failure, what will you write out of all of these? ABC, doctor. Which one? CBC. Right, I agree with you. Yes, CBC is correct. Anything else? Uh, echocardiograph. Yes, because with echocardiograph, we measure the ejection fraction. So yes, very important, that is correct. Uh, also ECG. Yes, also ECG. Of course, we have to do ECG. A function, uh, kidney function test. Yes, because we saw that. In all of them. Failure. Sorry? I think all of them. That's all right. of them. All of them is yes. correct. I just, I said in the previous slide that you measure BNP and anti-pro BNP. And kidney function is important because, um, you know, the kidneys are not being uh, perfused very well. Okay, not enough blood is going to the kidneys, so both BUN and creatinine are going to be raised, all right? Although in case of my mother-in-law, she had heart failure, but her BUN and creatinine remained normal. Um, uh, she is no longer alive, uh, um, but uh, you know, her BUN and creatinine were normal till the end. Anyway, so, and obviously there are more tests as well. We do many baseline tests as well, okay? So, and a lot of other tests are also recommended. Now we go on to the causes of heart failure. We have got about 20 minutes, no more than 20 minutes, 25 minutes, okay? The syndrome of heart failure can be produced by any heart condition. So now we are going to see the conditions. I've said that I've shown you the classification of the heart failure, which is more serious, which is less serious based on structure and function or the structure and the symptoms. Then I showed you two types of heart failure. One is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. One is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. All right. So less than 40% ejection fraction is half ref reduced ejection fraction, less than 40%. More than 50% is half PEF, preserved ejection fraction. So the question is, what is between 40 and 50? What do you call that? We call that intermediate, all right? Okay, uh, right. So uh, it reduces the pumping ability of the heart. Uh, and what are the conditions? What are the causes? The most common causes are coronary artery disease, hypertension. These, are the, these two are the most common causes dilated cardiomyopathy, something happens to the heart muscle, okay? Uh, we do not know exactly what it is, but it could be so many different things. And of course, valvular heart disease, like I showed you in the previous, one of the previous slides that there could be prolapse of a valve and there could be stenosis of a valve. All of these are going to increase the workload on the heart because many of the processes leading to heart failure are long standing and progress gradually. Very important point, listen carefully. They progress gradually. Heart failure can often be prevented or its progression slow down by early detection and intervention. Now, this is a condition in which the treatment can go on for 20, 20 years, 30 years, right? Heart failure, I mean, it will be different in different people. It will not be the same in every, every person, but heart failure is a chronic disease, right? I'm talking of chronic heart failure. Sometimes there is acute heart failure as well, but chronic heart failure, you must treat it. If you treat it, then the patient's life will be pro prolonged. Not only that, his quality of life will become much better. That is why we must diagnose and treat heart failure, all right? Uh, because its progression can be slowed down. Right, now we go on to systolic versus diastolic heart failure. Systolic is also known as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, and this is preserved ejection fraction. 
uh, the separate classification of systolic and diastolic heart failure is based on ejection fraction. Many people have both systolic and diastolic dysfunction, okay? Uh, right, systolic versus diastolic. Systolic ventricular dysfunction, more, most heart failure is the consequence of systolic dysfunction. Actually, you know, I've written most over here, but some books say that the systolic and diastolic are almost equal, you know? And I also said that sometimes they are both present in a, in a patient, okay? So what is the problem in systolic dysfunction? Myocardial contractility is impaired, leading to decreased in ejection fraction. So this is heart failure with decreased or reduced ejection fraction, HFREF. This is most commonly due to ischemic heart disease or hypertension. Now, so this is easy to understand. You know, there is a problem with contractility. The heart is contracting, but weakly, not with a strong force. Now, this one is different. Diastolic ventricular dysfunction is characterized by normal ejection fraction, but impaired ventricular relaxation, right? The heart is not relaxing like I've shown you this hand. I'll show it to you in a second, leading to decrease in ventricular filling. So what is the basic problem? The, the basic problem is, the heart is not filling with enough blood, all right? Now, note one thing over here. The ejection fraction is normal, okay? But the cardiac output is very low. Why is cardiac output low? Because the heart is not filling with enough blood, so it is not pumping out enough blood, so the output is low. But why is ejection fraction normal? Because it is the percentage that goes up, that is normal. Maybe it is 55%. Now the problem is something is compressing the heart like this, you know? If you put something in your heart, in your hand, you know, you're compressing it so enough fluid will not go into the heart because it is being compressed by something. It could be a disease in the heart wall. It can be outside the heart. Something is doing that, all right? So stroke volume will decrease, cardiac output will decrease, preload will decrease, but ejection fraction will not decrease because ejection fraction is a percentage of, uh, um, of the stroke volume, okay? Uh, it, is the, it is the percentage of the blood, actually it is a percentage of the end diastolic volume, okay? Not a percentage of the stroke volume. All Doctor? right, yes. Uh... I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, and this to like heart failure, uh, the heart uh, didn't have enough blood to uh, push it to other part of the body? Yes, yes, that's the, that is the problem. Not enough blood is coming into the heart, okay? Why? Because the heart is not dilating, something is compressing the heart, okay? okay. That is the problem uh, over here and here, what is the problem in here? The heart is dilated, it cannot compress, it cannot contract. You know, the first picture that I showed you, the title slide, the heart was dilated. That was cystical, systolic ventricular dysfunction. All right, right. Let's see whether you can answer this question or not. Uh, false, doctor. Anyone else? Okay, that is excellent. Yes, it is false, you know. Sometimes what happens is that the students don't read carefully. They'll just read the first part and then they will answer. So you must read the whole um, uh, case or the that is given. Uh, don't miss anything, you know. So it is just uh, saying the opposite of actually what the truth is. So the answer is false, you're right. Now this is systolic heart failure, ejection fraction is less than 40%. Ejection fraction de declines progressively and may drop to a single digit. Single digit means, you know, normal is 55%, single digit is 9%, voila, 8%. That is too low, you know. I don't know how the person will survive over there. Okay. Uh, 
With decreased ejection fraction, there is increase in end diastolic volume preload, ventricular dilatation, and increase in ventricular wall tension. So the consequence is that the heart is dilate, dilated. And you know, let me show you one thing, try to understand this thing. You know, when the heart muscle contracts in the muscle, in the sarcomere, we have got actin myosin filaments, right? Which are overlapping each other. When the heart contracts, the, the filaments slide, okay? See my fingers? They're sliding on each other, right? So the heart contracts. When the heart relaxes, they go back. Now, you see, if the heart dilates too much, they'll become like this, like this, like this. And eventually they will become like this. They will not be overlapping, all right? They may become like this. When this situation arises, then we cannot do anything. Then it is the end stage, all right? So when the heart dilates, they are not overlapping properly, all right? That is why the force of contraction is decreased, all right? Increased venous pooling um, uh, and increased preload, right? So more blood will stay in the heart uh, and it will not go out of the heart. This is a compensatory mechanism to increase stroke volume through Frank Starling mechanism. So the heart is trying, you know, the Frank, the Frank Starling mechanism is there. The end diastolic volume is there, but unfortunately the heart muscle is not working. So nothing uh, works uh, normally, nothing works properly. Even the Frank Starling mechanism will not work properly, right? It, so what happens, the consequence is fluid retention in the body. There will be pooling of blood in the, in the lungs, pulmonary, um, um, you know, the patient can get pulmonary edema and peripheral edema. Pulmonary edema, as we have discussed previously, is the most dangerous thing. If you don't treat the patient, uh, patient's pulmonary edema, he might die, all right? And the treatment is not difficult. Again, as I said, it's Lasix injection, furosemide intravenously, give him 80 milligram, give it to him again, okay? Right, so causes of systolic dysfunction, I'm going to go quickly now. Number one, systolic dysfunction, look at these three over here, impaired contractility, volume overload, pressure overload, all right? Too much of volume in the system, in the whole of the circulatory system, or even in like the, the example is anemia, okay? Actually, it's not in the circulatory system. This is volume overload in the heart, okay? And pressure overload. Now, I'm not going into the details because we do not have enough time, but impaired contractility is because of ischemic heart disease or cardiomyopathy, which is disease of the heart muscle. Volume overload, uh, not in the whole body, not in the cardiovascular system, but in the heart chambers. Why? Because of valvular insufficiency. I said that, you know, in prolapse, the blood goes back and then comes again into the ventricle. If there is tricuspid prolapse that I showed you previously, when the heart contracts, the blood, instead of going into the pulmonary artery, is going back into the right atrium as well. And then again, it's going to come back. So that is going to cause volume overload. The same volume is going to come back again and again. In anemia, again, this is a situation in which there is volume overload because the heart has to pump faster. Um, that is the normal response in anemia, okay? Uh, pressure overload, one example is hypertension and the other example is valvular stenosis. Okay, I've shown you these things over here. This, you know, this is actually an example of, uh, of prolapse, you know, the blood goes back, the valve, the valve does not close properly, okay? And this is actually showing you something else. Uh, uh, the bag that he's carrying is preload and he's going up this mountain that is the afterload, you know? Anyway, uh, you now understand that hopefully, and this is showing you stenosis. You know, this is a normal valve. It's a very small picture, but hope you can see it. This valve is not opening, it is narrowed, okay? So the heart, the heart is going to face more load, workload, more pressure, you know, to pump the blood out. So stenosis is sort of a pressure overload. 
right? The extent of systolic dysfunction is measured by cardiac output, ejection fraction, pulmonary congestion. So that is why I said that you have to do a full investigation uh, for the patient, okay? Yeah, he has to go or she has to go uh, undergo many tests, right? Diastolic dysfunction in 55% of cases, systolic function is preserved and heart failure is because of this diastolic dysfunction. Now this 55% is from somewhere, okay? It could be less than that, it could be more than that. So this is not uh, exact, this is sort of approximate. Maybe one study found this, okay? Now relaxation is abnormal, contraction is normal. Previously the contraction was uh, uh, abnormal, okay? So inadequate because the relaxation is abnormal. So the filling of the heart is inadequate. It is not filling with enough blood. So the cardiac output decreases. So note that the cardiac output decreases, but the ejection fraction does not decrease. And that was decrease in cardiac output is going to lead to pulmonary and systemic congestion, which means pooling of the blood. It will also lead to fluid retention because the kidneys are not being perfused. So prevalence of diastolic failure is higher in now. Who gets this? I mentioned one that are women, okay? But there are other people as well, like old age and women and hypertension and atrial fibrillation, right? Hypertensive patients, they get both. They get systolic and diastolic heart failure, both of these, okay? Uh, right, and in what, you know, if you remember in one of the previous slides, I've not shown you the figure over here, but in hypertension, the heart muscle becomes so thick that the volume inside the cavity or the chambers is reduced. That is why the heart is not filling, right? So these are the causes of diastolic dysfunction, delay in expansion. There is pericardial effusion, fluid is around the heart, accumulation of fluid constrictive pericarditis, look at this heart muscle. It has become so thick and it has become stiff. So it cannot relax, all right? And uh, increase in thickness of wall, you know, this is what I wanted to show you. See, myocardial hypertrophy, this is a normal heart. A lot of space inside the chambers, but here in hypertension or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is a different disease, there is no uh, space inside. The wall is so thick that so enough blood cannot flow into the heart. All right. Sorry. Delay in relaxation, aging, and ischemic heart disease. You know, I always show this picture. You know, I have not shown you uh, the larger version, but look at this girl and this old woman, right? We said aging. Look at her skin and look at her skin. Look at her hair and her hair. Okay, look her, at her eyes, you know, maybe this old woman has got cataracts. Okay, so whatever the difference you see in the faces, a fresh face, a very old face, okay? The same is going to be the difference in the organs. The same what you see over here will be the difference in the heart of this girl and the heart of this woman. The kidneys of this little girl and the kidneys of this old woman, so face, is the index, right? With age, every function goes down, every function declines. Okay, so even ischemic heart disease can cause delay in relaxation. All right, so I'll skip this uh, because this is something which needs a little more explanation. Uh, in which of the following types of heart failure will the ejection fraction be normal? Dystolic failure. Did you say B? B the first. Yes, B is the right answer. All right, so here, yes, there I have shown you this picture. So what I am saying is, you know, she might have cataract, although I don't see cataract in her eyes. When there is cataract, it's sort of white, whitish in the pupil. But see the difference, the fresh and old age, you know, wrinkles and look at her hair, brittle hair, normal healthy hair. Same is the difference in the organs inside the body. Okay, right. So right, then now we go on to right versus left ventricular dysfunction. Now, sometimes, not commonly, that is not very common. Most of the time when you get a dysfunction of the left heart, 
in a little uh, over a certain period of time, the patient will also develop a dysfunction of the right heart. So normally the heart failure is present in both sides, left side, right side. If it is in the right side, over time, it will develop on the left side as well. So right and left ventricular, it is clear, I don't have to go into a lot of details, but the consequences initially, you know, eventually later on, the failure will, is going to develop in both sides, but initially the consequences will be different. You know, Let us suppose it is left heart failure. Okay, first we'll dis discuss the right uh, heart failure. The right heart is, rece is receiving blood from the superior and inferior vena cavi, right? From all over the body. So if there is heart failure, it will not be able to pump enough blood into the pulmonary artery. So the blood is going to accumulate behind the right heart failure, which is because of gravity, we get swelling of the ankles, all right? The symptoms first appear uh, in the feet and the ankles if the patient is able to go around, we call that ambulatory patient. If it is bedridden, then it is the lower back which will swell. And if the problem is, uh, uh, so let's complete this one first. If the right heart fails, there will be congestion in the peripheral tissues. See the right heart fails. Because of gravity, the pressure is going to go down and the swelling appears over here in the feet and the ankles. Left heart receives blood from the lungs. So if the left heart fails, there is going to be problem in the lungs, which is known as pulmonary edema, or initially it is pulmonary congestion, right? They, the patient might develop pulmonary hypertension, but there could be pulmonary edema as well, which is a very dangerous situation. All right, so this is the difference. Initially, it, this will be there, right? Although the initial event that leads to heart failure may be primarily on the right or the left ventricular uh, vent, uh, ventricular in origin, long-term heart failure usually involves both sides, okay? Uh, the pathophysiological changes and compensatory responses are not significantly different between left and right uh, ventricular dysfunction, except for what I showed you in the previous slide, all right? And that brings us to the Last slide, I think, for this lecture. I'm going to just sum up what I said in this lecture. We have got right heart failure and we have got left heart failure. In right heart failure, there is going to be congestion of the peripheral tissues, right? And there is going to be dependent edema, which means if the person is ambulatory, he walks around, the edema is going to develop in the feet. Ascites is accumulation of fluid in the uh, peritoneal cavity in the abdomen. You know, I've shown you pictures previously. That is an advanced stage. Liver congestion will be there because, you know, liver is right below over here on the right side. So it is the liver hepatic vein is training into the inferior vena cava. So it's going to be there as well. And GI tract congestion. You know, the patients with heart failure, they don't feel hungry. They lose appetite because of GI tract congestion. Even we will get edema in the GI tract, all right? So that will lead to anorexia and GI distress. And when the patient is not eating well, obviously he or she is going to lose weight as well, right? Left heart failure, there is going to be decreased cardiac output and there's going to be decreased pulmonary congestion. This is something very dangerous. Let us look at decreased cardiac output first. Decreased cardiac output, not enough blood is going to the skeletal muscles. So activity intolerance, the patient cannot do physical exertion. Okay, it is a sign of decreased tissue perfusion. Another sign of decreased tissue perfusion is that the urine output will be low. You know, if you touch the hands, they will be cold, okay? So these are different signs of decreased tissue perfusion. Now, pulmonary congestion, you can get pulmonary edema, the most dangerous condition, or you can get impaired gas exchange. That will cause difficulty in breathing, right? It, that is what causes dyspnea. This also causes dyspnea. So the other signs are cyanosis. If you look at the nails, maybe you'll see that the nails are bluish darker in color. If the lips are blue, 
that is more serious, that shows central cyanosis. And it can lead to orthopnea, which is difficulty in breathing. It can also lead to cough with frothy sputum, right? Maybe uh, there is some blood as well. Frothy means there'll be bubbles in the sputum. And paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, when the patient lies down in the bed, he gets dyspnea because blood accumulates in the lungs. What is the treatment? Uh, tell him not to lie down, tell him to sleep or stay in a propped up position, which means keep a few pillows so that he's sort of like in sitting position, not in lying position, all right? So, uh, oh my God, there is more as well. I think because our time is over, I don't know how many slides are left, but what we will do is we'll complete this in the next lecture. Very few slides are less left. I've already shown you. If you don't mind, I think I'll just take five more minutes, all right? I'll go quickly because we have done all this thing. I've shown you the causes of, the, uh, of systolic and diastolic heart failure. So almost, you know, you can um, just... Um, think over it and work through these causes. So right heart failure, if the left heart fails, there is increased uh, congestion in the lungs, the right heart is also going to fail. Pulmonary hypertension, okay, same thing, left ventricular failure will lead to pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary disease, now this, this has got nothing to do with left heart failure. Any pulmonary disease, some, sometimes pulmonary hypertension, could appear in certain lung diseases, okay? Valve incompetence, again, this has got nothing to do with left heart failure. Cardiomyopathy, okay? And some congenital defect that are present from birth, okay? Then left heart failure, you already know hypertension, myocardial infarction is heart attack if there is damage to the left side of the heart. Stenosis, you know, we had stenosis and regurgitation over here as well tricuspid and pulmonary valve, and we have that over here as well, okay? Mitral valve, or uh, these are the valves in the left atrium. Uh, so uh, pulmonary capillary pressure, 10 millimeter is a normal. It can go up to 25, that means pulmonary hypertension. So uh, once again, the pressure in systemic circulation is 120 by 80, systolic, diastolic, so very high. In, Pulmonary circulation, it is a low pressure circulation, low pressure circuit. So the pressure is 10 millimeter or 12 millimeter of mercury, right? Okay, so compensatory mechanism, what, does the, what happens when there is heart failure? Frank Starling mechanism is activated, it doesn't work. Sympathetic nervous system works. Now I'll take one minute, okay? I hope you won't mind. This is a bad thing. You know, I said, that when the organs are not getting enough blood, they will complain to the brain. And the brain is going to tell the heart to work more through sympathetic nervous system. Now that is not a good thing. Why? Because the heart is sick. It, is, it cannot work. There is some problem with the heart, it is ill. And the brain is telling it to do more work. That is not good. That will lead to further aggravation of the heart failure. So we have to do something about this. The brain will tell the heart to beat faster. That is why the heart rate increases in heart failure. So you must give beta blockers over there. Renin angiotensin aldosterone system because the kidneys are not getting perfused. So the kidneys will start retaining water in the body. Again, not good. Treatment, give diuretics. Natriuretic peptides, um, like BNP and ANP, they are good. We need them to be there. And there is a drug for that as well. Endothelines are not good. They cause vasoconstriction and increase workload on the heart. Inflammatory mediators are markers and there will be myocardial remodeling and hypertrophy. All right. Although there are some details of this thing, but that was the last slide. Luckily, at some other stage, during the summer holidays, if you want, we can go into more details of the heart failure, especially this hypertrophy and remodeling is an important point. And there is a treatment for that as well, when we give treatment for heart failure. So that is all. I took a little over time. Uh, so if there are any questions, you can ask me now. 
All right. I think you have, you're all asleep. Huh? So that's all right. Thank you very much. And inshallah, I'll see you next time. Okay. Uh, doctor. You, doctor. Yes, go ahead, please. I just want to ask you about the lectures we have on the mid. Uh, Mirna posted those lectures, did she not? Uh, uh, well, let me think. This is PAPO 1. You know, I'm teaching five subjects, so I forget. Uh, we have um, uh, inflammation and repair, and we have hemodynamic disorders, and we have ischemic heart disease. Three lectures, right? Doctor? Uh, you got Okay, thank you, doctor. Yes, yes, thank you, doctor. So of these course, are doctor. sort of longish lectures, you know, so do prepare well, although the questions are not difficult. I've given you straightforward questions, but the content is a bit too much, okay? Uh, Dr. Burr, the uh, written uh, question. Uh, 